topic did you want to debate on um i'd like to do oh sorry i was on, on my laptop i'd like to debate the gender affirming care for minors all right what about it um so personally i find myself very i think i'm moderate but i'm very left-leaning however one topic that will always be iffy towards me is gender affirming care for minors. Um, I personally have known a young boy since he was three years old. He just thought he was a girl. He would wear girl clothing. He would dress up as a girl. That's just how he presents it. And as a three year old, that's perfectly fine. And I'm happy that his parents allowed him to express himself that way. However, I don't think a child is in a place both mentally and physically to make an informed decision on gender affirming care. Um, they have the rest of their lives ahead of them. They're not fully developed until they're like 25, maybe 21, 25. And for them to make a decision that might not only change how their life moves forward, but their very biology is, I don't want to say dangerous, but dangerous. Uh, so yeah, so I would just disagree on a couple of things here. Um, first of all, when it comes to gender affirming care, the children aren't the ones making the decision. This is a decision being made typically by a team of doctors, usually a therapist, a GP, um, and oftentimes an endocrinologist. Um, these are, as well as the parents, these are decisions that parents are making when parents have a child who is, um, diagnosed gender dysphoric. So, um, gender affirming care for minors comes in a long list of things but if it seems like you're specifically talking about the medical side when you have a child who's diagnosed gender dysphoric which happens to about 40,000 children per year in the u.s um if the gender dysphoria is severe you have a uh benefit risk analysis to now make with 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 regards to your child and that benefit risk analysis goes is my child at risk for self-harm and suicide um if so how bad is that and if so is this something that we want to look look towards doing. Now, we can see that like most kids don't get this. Only about a thousand kids, uh, give or take, are diagnosed, uh, who are diagnosed gender dysphoric receive uh, HRT and only about like 12,000 get um, pubertal suppressants. Um, so the amount of kids that are actually getting these things is low. The bulk of kids are not receiving um, gender affirming care in this way. Uh, the bulk of it is social, right? However, we do need to be aware that some kids are going to need more support than just that. Now, gender affirming care medically, HRT and um, pubertal suppressants are safe, right? We have so much evidence to show that they're safe. Pubertal suppressants, for instance, like Lupron Depot PED, have been be have they, we've been using them since the '90s, right? So there's 30 years of of evidence to show that these are these are safe, right? Um, so I would just I would just argue when it comes to gender affirming care, like this is sort of what we need to do. And I did just want to touch on you had mentioned uh, 25 about the brain maturing. When your brain matures at 25, all that's happening is that it's uh, preening unused neurons. Um, so a lot of people uh, tend to think that like, oh, well, you're not fully developed until 25. You are. It's just or, or let me rephrase that. Your brain never stops developing. Like your brain never stops. Even at 25, it doesn't stop. It's just that it preens off specific neurons that are not being used. Um, and people have kind of misconflated this with like, you're not able to make decisions pre-25, which we just know not to be the case. We actually uh, have uh, have uh, medical studies that kids can assent to medical decisions as young as like 10 years old, if not younger. Like if, they're, if we're just seeing if whether they can assent to these decisions or not. So yeah, that would be uh, my take on it if you wanted to go now. Well, yes, of course, at 25, you know, before 25, you're able to make an informed decision. But if you cannot, let's say you can't buy alcohol, you can't smoke until you're 18, what is appropriate or understandable until you are to make a decision like that before you are of legal age? And while I do believe that gender affirming care should be provided in socially or some context, because if you know, when you know, you know to a certain degree, but I don't think on the medical side it should be provided to somebody who is not a legal adult 
end. While the parents can support the decision, you don't know if the child completely makes the decision on their own. And while there is a team of doctors around them that is supporting this or providing the care, at the end of the day, it is the child who is putting this in motion based on their wants. And yes. Then, so just, just to uh, address that, the regret rate for people who've received gender affirming care and transitioned is about like 1.3 to 3 percent. So we actually know that like the, the bulk of children receiving this thing, the bulk of people in general receiving this it, are people that want to go through with it. Right. That's why the regret rate is so low. If the regret rate the, for the regret rate sat like at 30 percent or 25 percent or any of these higher numbers, I'd probably say, yeah, there might be something here that we have to look at. But the regret rate is low, and it's low because, like most people, who, um, when we look at the way gender develops, your gender identity develops inside of your body around uh, four to seven. Like ages four to seven is when your gender. By seven, it's typically well so well developed that like most people know what they are um, around seven years old, whether they have the language to say it or not. Um, so I would just I would just argue on that in that point with 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 that. Give me a second. Sure. I I think and I, I can't make I can't comment or apply how I feel onto every case because there are people are different, people work in different ways. However, I just don't think it would be I don't think it's safe or reasonable to provide to give that to a to medically. You can't give that you can't give a child the option to medically alter themselves until they're adults. Similar similar to plastic surgery, you don't give a child plastic surgery because of body dysmorphia or. That's not true. We do that all the time. But you shouldn't. Why would you? You think it's appropriate for a child to have a BBL because they don't like how they look? No, but we give children breast reduction all the time. Children can get no. Children get nose jobs all the time. Like we 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 provide these things constantly. Like a, a child getting breast reduction is our breast reduction is another form of 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 care that we we provide. So what's the difference between giving a, a, a like if I have a a fifteen year old girl who gets breast reduction because her breasts are too large? versus a, a 15 year old trans uh trans boy who gets um mastectomy because he doesn't want breasts like what is the there's no principal difference here well i personally don't think you should be reducing a child's breast because she doesn't like how big her boobs are if they're medically if they're causing a back if they're causing back problems or she's in physical pain that's one thing but a child should not be physically altering their body because they don't like it yeah, what's the material harm though that this that, that this would cause? What would be the material harm? Well, as, again, as a child, you are in a, you aren't in a place to have a full world view. I don't want to see it develop because there are certain things from that point you can make a decision for. Wait, again, this is oh, this is this is not true, right? We have like evidence that shows like there are plenty of things that that children are able to consent to and not consent to, right? For instance, if I have a child who doesn't want me to hug them, they can consent to not being hugged. They can say, hey, I don't consent to you t hugging me, whatever age they may be, right? Um, there are certain things that we don't allow children to do, like uh, smoking and alcohol is mostly because of how it's going to affect your lungs and affect their brains. It doesn't really have anything to do with whether or not they can consent to these two things. It's mostly how they'll affect their developing brains. But there's no link between... Uh, gender affirming care and like a negative effect on brain development, right? So you'd have to show, you'd have to show these things as having a negative link. You can't just say, well, they are negative. You have to show the negatives in them. Well, as you mentioned, um, children get nose jobs, children reduce their breasts, but do you think that is more of a societal issue and how society projects idealism on children and their bodies? as opposed to an actual dysmorphia? Do we address how society treats them? Or do we address how the child, and how do we address how the child feels about themselves? Or do we just allow them to change themselves? Just depends. It would be case by case, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hold pretty firm and fast that like if, if, a, if a 15 year old girl doesn't want large breasts, I don't think it's a big deal that she gets her breast reduction. I don't think that's a big deal at all. I could care less. There's there's no principal harm happening here. There's no harm per se, but again, as a 
as a 15 year old girl you don't see breast is different because breasts are very they're unless you're having she you can still breastfeed you know breasts still have their primary function once you you know you cut them off or you reduce them however when you're taking let's say hormone blockers you're taking hormones in general just you are altering how your brain and your body function you so, take off your so you don't alter pain. you don't your brain doesn't hrt doesn't alter your brain right not more than just normal hormones would during during uh puberty right there's no negative to, to your brain from going on hrt and again we've seen this we know this based on clinical trials of these drugs based on uh plenty of reports and like i said the bulk of kids aren't getting this like the w path standard is there for a reason it makes it so it's ridiculously hard to get a kid on on uh pubertal suppressants or hrt because we want to mitigate any any possible detransitioners that may be in the bunch but because the detransition rate is so low it seems like we've done a really good job at this but then if that's the case if they aren't going back on their decision if we still allow them to present as however they like what's What's the issue with waiting until they're adult and adult? Because when you go through Tanner stage two and you go through puberty, your body is going to make changes that will worsen gender dysphoria. So if I, for instance, am a trans, uh, a trans, uh, bo like if we have a trans boy, their body going through puberty and breast developing is going to increase their dysphoria, which is going to make them at more risk for suicidality and self harm. If uh, you're a trans woman or trans girl, right, and you go through puberty your voice is going to deepen and of all the things that like you can change like you can't change your voice without surgery right like you can do vocal exercises but your voice is always going to be low if it if you go through puberty right this is something that they their face shape is going to change their their body like there's a reason why boys and girls up until like age 13 age 12 11 12 13 when they hit tanner stage 2 all kind of look the same right because uh testosterone and estrogen in boys and girls is about the same it's the increases in these that are going to cause the differences in appearance and those differences in appearance are going to elevate gender dysphoria so this would be the case of why we would want to prevent that from happening to make sure that we mitigate the harm of uh, suicidality and self-harm like i said because there are some people that don't need to there are some people that don't need medical gender affirming care they, they don't ever they don't ever need it because their gender dysphoria is not that bad they they are they get fine by just fine with the with social uh affirmation some don't some need medical affirmation again i have said nothing against medical affirmation my issue is the age that it happens at and instead of again allowing somebody who is underage like we can't do can't buy a house can't do all this legally why would we like why would we allow them to pos to alter their very body and possibly psychi um, psychiatry that might not be the right word to use however hormones when you use hormones you are changing how your brain functions in a way adding certain hormones and blocking others will definitely change how your body is functioning yeah, not in um, any not in any principled negative difference, right? Like that would be like saying that like, oh, there's gonna be a harm uh, when um, when girls go through puberty versus when boys go through puberty, because girls are going to go because like right like you're just going through the type of puberty that other kids go through, right? Our brains aren't hardwired to take estrogen over testosterone. Do you know how we know this? Because women who have PCOS right, have high levels of testosterone from puberty, they, these women don't have brain problems, right? Men who have high levels of estrogen don't have brain problems because they go through puberty with high levels of estrogen. That just doesn't happen. I don't quite understand how that debunks what I said. Because though. there are people whose bodies are going to produce more estrogen or testosterone than gender affirming care is going to do. Their bodies are naturally going to give them more hormones than what you're complaining about. And these people don't have negative, negative uh, uh, developmental repercussions from their bodies doing this, right? That's just not something that happens. There's no evidence that hormone replacement therapy negatively affects the way your brain develops there is no evidence of this anywhere um, 
you think on that. Okay. Was that it? Are no, you no. are you just thinking about it now? No, I'm thinking. I didn't want to make sure I have my thoughts together. Okay. While sure, let's say let's let's go with what you said because there might not be any proof. There might not be any proof that it is problematic or truly brain altering. Let's, but what is so bad about letting the person question have an adult perspective on it and so they can view it from they can view their lives from an adult um adult perspective and instead of saying oh we need we need you to take hormone blockers and do this and do this so you don't suicide why don't we start to, why don't we get them therapy get them resources that they're able to better work through this I don't want to say this. We do do all this. Again, all of this is done. That's what gender affirming care, gender affirming care is. In order to even receive the gender affirming care, you need six months of marked incongruence from a therapist. Like they are getting this care. That's the thing. This stuff is happening, right? But again, some people's dysphoria is going to going to result in self harm or suicide suicidality. And as somebody who who has a child, if my child is at risk for suicide. I will do anything I can to make sure my child is alive. W anything I can. Well, I don't disagree. Again, I don't disagree with that sentiment. I just think that a child, a child cannot completely understand what they really want. I think I'm backtracking. Yes, but this is why this is why they weren't, they're oh, not I've... consenting to the medical procedure. They're assenting to it. The parents are the one consenting to it because the parents are the ones who who have consent, right? A child also can't understand like chemotherapy, right? They probably don't understand all that's going to happen to them if they go on chemo. But like a parent can make that decision to put their kid on chemo if their kid has cancer. Their kid is at risk of death, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just like children shouldn't really be going to have sex, children shouldn't be making these adult decisions. It's an it's an adult decision. Just like the parent has to consent. Oh, wait, children shouldn't have care. have sex with adults. Yeah, but that's because of the power dynamic. That's because adults well, no. can manipulate. Sorry. And... But I like, I don't. Oh, I was just gonna say, I don't care if like sixteen or seventeen year olds sleep with each other. I don't give a shit about that. I would only give a shit if they're sleeping with adults because there's a power dynamic there. There's there's predatory behavior there. But if they're with each other, I don't really give a shit. They're both they're both the same the same age. They can consent to each other. Well, they can consent to each other. See, I don't want to backtrack and get on um start another argument, but children, let's say two sixteen year olds should not be having sex while there's no longer a predatory nature to it or the risk of statutory rape. Children aren't in place to understand the emotional weight that having sexual intercourse does yeah I, I think that's just though putting putting your own thing on some people some people sex doesn't have an emotional weight right there are some people who sex just doesn't have emotions tied behind it whether you're you know, whether you're 16 or not like we can say that 16 year should be practicing safer sex i fully believe we should be we should be teaching comprehensive sex education so that they're they're safe Right. There could be an argument made for that, that like 16 year olds probably don't aren't able to accurately because of the the lack of impulse control. They're not able to accurately uh, practice safe sex. But that's what we, we curtail that. That's why areas with comprehensive sex education have less STIs per population and less uh, pregnancy per population. Right. Because we control for all of this. You say that I am projecting an emotional weight onto sexual intercourse. However, are you suggesting that there is nothing per there shouldn't be anything personal? We shouldn't encourage. I don't want to say encourage, but that there shouldn't be anything personal about the potential of creating a baby, a another human being. And with all the stuff with Roe v. Wade, you don't think that there should be some weight put on that, 
before there is any weight. Well, no, that. but I've already addressed this. I said that's why we do comprehensive sex education. That's why we, we okay. in the areas that we do this, teen pregnancy drops significantly. STIs drop significantly. There's a difference between the weight of like the outcomes of your decision versus like whether I'm emotionally invested in the action. And I'm just saying that some people are not emotionally invested in sex, whether they're whatever, whatever age they might be. They just don't have any emotional investment in the act of sex. But they should still have like there should still be an investment in making sure that sex is safe for everybody. Right. Like I think com I think contraception should be provided free of charge for every American. Right. I think that we should be doing whatever we can to mitigate STIs and pregnancies and whatever population they pop up in. But wouldn't it wouldn't it just make well, I'm, I'm not saying promote abstinence. And I do think it's important to teach it's important to teach them about that. But I mean, if you're going to do it, do it safely, of course, but you shouldn't be doing it. Well, yeah, because abstinent education. Well, OK, we can have we can have the conversation yeah. all day like they shouldn't be doing it. But like pe humans have been having sex since the age of like 14 for like all of human history. Right. Sure. What like, does a, what, of course, of course. But what does what does a Why does a 16 year old need to be having sex? Why does a 16 year old? Why does anybody what, need to have sex? <laughs> Nobody needs to have sex. Nobody needs to do. Holy shit. Who the fuck just bought the hundred dollar Patreon tier on my Patreon? Jesus Christ. Uh sorry uh nobody has to have sex right nobody has to do has to do anything it's that they're probably going to right and it's better to mitigate the harm uh that is that could arouse from them doing it unsafely i got distracted i was reading the chat i'm sorry But yeah, I just think that like to not teach sex, like we know abstinence doesn't work. Every place that has abstinence only education has higher rates of literally everything. They have higher rates no, of STIs. Course, they have. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I just I agree with you. Like we should not be promoting abstinence. And if, again, if you're going to do it, you need to have the tools to do it safely. However, saying that it's similar similar with transitioning if you're going to do it we want you to have the therapy we want you to have all of this and i want you to do it safely and the safest way to do it is i per again i personally think and this could be incorrect my personal views the safest way to do it is when you are an adult you have an adult perspective on life you know where you're going and you can't say that you can't say most or even all 16 year olds have that yeah, I would just say I would just say if we if we if we go too much in like ideal idealism, we're we're gonna have issues where people are now popping up pregnant and whatever. Right. And again, like dangerous in, in this day and age right now to get to get an unwanted pregnancy. Right. But we can even we can even take it a step further, right? You're we're talking about like whether they have the mental understanding to do this. Like if a if a fifteen year old gets pregnant, right, would you allow for them to have an abortion, even though abortions are life-changing decisions or going through with a pregnancy is a life-changing decision and these decisions can have mental health repercussions they like we allow we allow for decisions to be made all the time that are life-changing when you're when you're young it's just about are those decisions being made um with proper informed uh consent and assent and are they being made uh with via the proper people like your doctors your therapists all these other things um, pivoting off your previous question with the 15 year old who's pregnant, um, I don't think the 15 year old, again, is any place to make a rational choice on whether or not they should have an abortion. While I support abortion completely, um, I support abortion. If it, I don't, I support abortion. I support adoption. Um, however, that sh I don't think that choice that each, um, the 15 year old's input should be, of course, heavily considered. But at the end of the day, it needs to be the choice of the parents especially if the 15 year old is under the parents roof if they're going to end up being responsible for taking care of the child um especially with adoption there are ways when the 
15 year old is able to take care of them when they're adult, when they're an adult, when they have a stable job. There's going to be ways that their doctor would say for them to reach out to them. If that's what, let's say, the child, that's what the child would want, then. Um, I just want to say it's it. This would seem like a contradiction to your earlier objections. Your earlier objections is sh kid, children shouldn't go through life altering things. But if a parent wants their child to stay pregnant, they should have to go through the life altering decision of pregnancy. I'm not saying they should. I'm saying the parent. It, well, no, you got me there. Um, however. Well, that just goes into the point of me saying ch ch children shouldn't be having children shouldn't be having sex, and I wait till you're an adult. Yeah, but again, they are doing it. So, like, we could live in a we it would be great to live in a world where no child gets gets pregnant before the age of eighteen, but we don't live in that world. We live in a world where this is something that can happen, does happen, and if we're saying uh, it's not okay for children to make life altering decisions about their gender but it is okay for them to make life altering it's okay for parents to force life altering decisions about whether or not they give birth i just feel like this is a a, a large contradiction in logic well personally as i said before just children shouldn't be having sex and similar with while well, there's no way to stop it similar with similarly with her, there's no way to stop gender affirming care my whole argument was that it needs to be you need to wait until you are an adult to make a fully informed decision I never said that we shouldn't be happening. I said it needs to be, and I support gender affirming here. Yes, but uh, again, I'm pointing out the contradiction in the logic of not allowing, uh, saying that gender affirming care is bad because it's a life altering decision that they're being that they're making too early, that somebody is making for a child too early. But pregnancy is not a life altering decision that somebody is making for a child too early. There would be a there, there would be a contradiction here in the logic. Let me think, because you're right. No, I actually did contradict myself. How again? I know I contradict myself. There's no however to that. Mm -hmm. But but the whole argument has always been me to me. The whole argument, at least the base of my argument, I might not have been. Representing that where we are, whole argument that um that I've been trying to make is need to wait, and if that comes, and so if you just decide to get gender affirming care when, let's say, you want gender affirming care when you're 15, let's say, or you want to have you want to have children when you're, you cannot control children. That's the thing. You can't control children. They're not gonna. They're going to do what they want. But at the end of the day, you need to give them the tool. You need to encourage them and give them the tools to wait until they are adults. And once you're an adult, you're a legal adult. You can do everything an adult can do. That's when you should be happy to make that decision. Yeah, sure. This just isn't addressing like the crux of the argument, right? You're saying you're saying they have to wait because I, I it's, it's just going to go in circles now. But you're saying they have to wait because yeah. of X, but you don't think they have to wait because of X in other instances. You think it's only this instance. In other instances, they don't have to wait because of X. Well, gender um, transitioning and pregnancy tend to be well. Gender affirming gender affirming care is more I don't want to say preventable, but it can be put off 
more. So- I don't want to say put for some for down. some people, sure. Some people only need social care. Yeah, one hundred percent. There are some people that don't need medical care. There are some that do. And to say that because three percent of the population might have have regret on this thing, right? That ninety seven percent of the population can't get it is just kind of messed up, especially when we know that there are measures in place to try to mitigate uh, detransition as much as humanly possible. Again, that's why we follow the W path standard uh, uh, care model, right? That's why we need to show up if you want if you're going through insurance, you need to show a marked uh, incongruence of six months. It has to be consistent and persistent. And the and the the criteria for gender uh, gender dysphoria is is stricter for kids than it is for adults because they're kids. But if that's the thing, why are we? Why can't? If that's the thing, as you said, these kids, these kids, you it's restrict. They're tighter restriction. There's more hoops you have to jump through. If that's the case, why can they? Well, I don't want to say why can't they wait because because they may be at risk for self harm and suicidality. But that's something they're going to have to. If I don't like, okay. That's again, we can go back to the plastic surgery thing. If, if I don't like the way my nose looks, is that if you think it's appropriate for me at the age of 16 to have it removed, like have it redone? Because at 16, yeah, I don't give a shit. You're 16. What do I care? What I don't, there's, I don't see any harm from a 16 year old getting a nose job. <clears throat> I don't see any harm in this act, like any, any, um, uh, any principal harm there, right? I think, rather, a lot of this is just I think, and I, personally, we're just going to, we're just arguing in circles. Um, you brought up two good points and have definitely made me rethink some of my perspective. However, I just, again, children shouldn't, you're a child, wait till, wait till you're an adult. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't trans, and if you are at, let's see, if you are suicidal, if you are at risk, there are steps and things in place instead of changing changing how your body is wired. Yeah, I, I would just say that they are taking those steps. Those steps that are in place, they're doing those. That's part of gender affirming care. Like therapy is part of gender affirming care. I'm just I was addressing the medical side. I'm not I don't know if I made that clear or not. Yeah, I, the only the only current effective way to mitigate gender dysphoria is tra- is transitioning, whether that be social or medical. That is the only way. Like there is no other there is no other way that has been been found effective by any medical professional, any therapeutic professional, any of these people. There's no there is no other way that's been found effective to mitigate like actual dysphoria. Not like just being dysphoric, because there's a difference between like being diagnosed with gender dysphoria and just being a little dysphoric. Because everybody gets dysphoric, cis people get dysphoric. I mean, I suppose you're right. I may not, I'm not, I don't think I'm able, I'm not qualified to speak on this because, again, I'm not, I don't suffer with gender dysmorphia. I don't intend on going through gender altering care. And while I don't think people, I don't think people have the right to make complete, I don't think people who aren't aware of it and as understanding of it or experience it have a right to make decisions, complete decisions on that. But just wait, for, like, just wait till you're a legal adult. Yeah, but they're not the I ones have... making the decision, right? 
It would be it would if if it was the case that oh, I thought, um, I thought... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I didn't mean to talk over you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I just said if it was the case where children were walking into hospitals by themselves, I'd agree with you. But they're not the ones making the decision. It's a usually a group decision between the parents, the doctors, the therapist, the child. It's it's not the child's own decision. Because the, the, don't you think that, let's say, the doctor, they go through the process, things are starting to get there, they're starting with gender affirming care, whether it be through the therapy, and they're looking into the medical side of it. If the doctor comes to the conclusion, if the doctor comes to the conclusion and the parents are saying, you know, this isn't the best, this isn't intelligent, this isn't the best option for this child. Don't you think that they'd be vilified, that these parents would be, the parents or the doctors would be vilified for denying them that? No, they deny them all the time. That's why only a thousand kids get a, get uh, gender affirming care out of the 40,000 that are diagnosed with gender dysphoria. They get denied all the time. And does, do the child's issues go away? Usually, no. They usually just have to wait. But again, these are, again, the ones that are getting it are typically the extreme cases. Right. It's not typically the ones that like just social social uh, affirmation will work for them. It's it's those aren't the ones that are <laughs> getting the gender affirming care. Usually the ones that are getting the care are the ones that are that it's needed. Gender dysmorphia is an internal thing. And while doctors, well, doctors, I'm not saying doctors, well, doctors are qualified to make assessments on how the child feels. At the end of the day, the only person knows how the child feels as a child. There can, so, I just, with your argument, I don't understand. This chat has me laughing. Anyway, um, there's, Again, the child, the child, only the child knows how they feel. So, and what, so, actually, let me ask you, what determines a case is more, dis, what, what makes the case more extreme than another case, and what case is it okay for a doctor to deny them that care, as opposed to uh, when they, when they would be approved for such care? Yeah, if they're at risk for self-harm or suicidality, that's what, that's what it is, right? If, if they're at risk for self-harm or suicide, I would say probably should get them the care. Some people have gender dysphoria but aren't at risk for self-harm, right? Some people have gender dysphoria but aren't, aren't suicidal, right? It's a case-by-case -case basis. There's no way to know for sure. Like, everybody would be different, and everybody would be diagnosed so if, differently. I didn't mean to talk over you, so, but, so if... I tell the doctors I'm suicidal and they believe me, does that mean I should be able to get the care I want? Yeah, if that suicidality is persistent over six months, yeah. But usually there are going to be signs, right? You're going to be able to, like, they, they're they pretty good about knowing whether somebody is actually suicidal or not. Right? Like, this, um, they're... Personally, I see, personally with that, I disagree. As I've had my own experience. Well, I can't speak, use my experience as a well, yard fit for everybody. But they're not as they aren't as good as you think. <laughs> yeah, but for kids, I would argue that they are. Kids are not good at lying for six months straight, right? I, I, I kids I, aren't kids I, aren't good at lying for five minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, depends on the age range. However, um, again, I was a, I was that I was that child at one point who was incredibly suicidal and was going through my own mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. And while I'm sure doctors that are specialized in gender affirming care will have better, will have, um, will be more versed in, in that area. Again, I don't think a doctor's not going to always know how that child feels. So what, again, and so again, if I, So 
So if you're suicidal for six months, that means you should change how you feel instead of addressing the suicidal the suicidal ideation of what drives that and working through maybe maybe working through that. If you are at risk, high risk of suicide. Like oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you're at high risk of suicide, and this is due to gender dysphoria, and this gender dysphoria is persistent for upwards of six months, like we know that this is this is this is something that you're suffering through, then yeah, I would say aff- affirming care, especially again, since it is safe for like for the for the vast majority of people, uh, I would say this is something that we can we can provide. But why not work on why don't work on appreciating like, accepting yourself as you are because in let's say we always promote body, body positivity this 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 but we can't do that when it comes to how people were because gender dysphoria can't. gender dysphoria doesn't care how much you love yourself it's a mental it's a medical diagnosis because you have a disorder you have a disorder well, that affects the way that your body uh engage your gender identity engages with your sex you could you could love yourself as much as you want it doesn't matter gender dysphoria is not going to care well so is body dysmorphia body dysmorphia is similar are you suggesting that it's okay for body dysmorphia is not similar body dysmorphia makes you see yourself differently right you physically see something that is different from the from what everybody else is seeing about your body People with body dysmorphia may physically see themselves as 300 pounds, like they actually see themselves as fat when they are stick thin because they have an ED. This is vastly different. Gender dysphoria doesn't change the way you look at yourself. It just changes the the dis- I'm sorry? If you see yourself, seeing yourself, if you see yourself as a different gender, as you feel, you feel on the inside and see yourself as something completely different than what you are, are you saying that doesn't change back how you see yourself? No, it doesn't affect the physic. It doesn't affect the physical way you view your body. You still view your body the way it is. There's just distress about the way your body it looks. Whereas body dysmorphia can physically change the way you view your body, like can physically make you see your body differently than what it actually looks like. I, I'm I'm aware. I've, I've had I, I've had body dysmorphia, and I I've, I've worked through it myself, which is why again I do not think my fellow basketball American. I'm sorry, your chat's funny. What's funny but about again, that? Pardon? What's funny about that? Oh, no, your chat's me. Your chat's funny. Yeah, I, I don't know what was funny about that joke. That basketball American is kind of funny. What's funny about it? I don't know as a, I, I don't want to pull that as a black woman, but I'm black. I find it funny. That's all. Okay. I mean, you can. I'm still asking, like, what's funny about it? I don't think it's that funny of a joke. I don't, I don't get what the, the humor is in it. I don't know. I don't know what's funny about farting, but it still is. It's, it's just funny. Okay. Interesting. Anyway, we've been chatting for about 45 minutes. Was there anything else or, because if not, I'm going to move on oh, to no the next problem. person. Okay. No problem. Thank you for calling in.